This is the introductory video for the resonance on a string lab. The most important part of our apparatus is actually this string here. We've also got a mechanical vibrator which is going to jiggle the string up and down. The string is anchored over here and then there is this little control box to control at what frequency the mechanical arm vibrates the string. Over on this far end, where my microphone doesn't quite reach, we've got a pulley and the string goes over the pulley and on this end there is a mass. How much mass you have hanging off there depends on which string you're using. And because it's a little easier on the equipment, you may find when you enter the lab that you have to actually dangle the string over the pulley like this. So it may have been left slack on your desk when you first walked in. Now the equipment will be set up on the desk for you, but there's a few things you should double check before you start taking data just to make sure you get good results. First of all, you want to look at the apparatus via the same angle you're looking at it right now, that is horizontally, and you want to make sure that the string is straight all the way across. That is, that the connection point on the post and the connection point on the mechanical arm and the connection point on the pulley are all basically lined up in one straight line. Then you want to look straight down from the top and make sure that the same is true that way. That is, that you don't have any sort of zigzag pattern between the post, the mechanical arm, and the pulley. So just make sure that that string is straight as much as possible. The purpose of this experiment is we want to measure the speed of a wave on the string. We're going to do that both experimentally and we'll also do it theoretically and we'll compare our two velocity values. Now the basic physics here is that this mechanical vibrator is going to send a vibration down the string, so a wave down the string in that direction. When it hits the pulley at the opposite end, that wave is going to bounce back. So most of the time, the wave traveling this way and the wave traveling back just kind of interfere with each other and you get this jangly pattern. However, for certain wavelengths, the peaks and the troughs of the waves will overlap and what you'll get is a standing wave pattern which is to say that there will be sections of the string called antinodes where the string vibrates a lot and other sections where the string is completely still, called nodes. So these are called harmonic patterns. They're also called resonances. You're going to be studying six to eight harmonic patterns on this string, taking measurements and using those in order to get your graph. So let me show you some of the harmonic patterns. So I turn this on and I'm going to set it to approximately the right frequency to get the fundamental harmonic. Now the fundamental harmonic is the one where it's basically moving like a skip rope. The antinode is right in the middle, that's where the string is moving the most, and the nodes, the points where it's not moving at all, are at the ends of the string. So that one doesn't look too dramatic, but when I go up to the second one, you'll see it looks kind of neat. So now you see that there are two antinodes, that is there are two places on the string where it's vibrating a lot and right in the middle we've got a third node. So we still have nodes at the ends but we also have this one in the middle. So this is called the second harmonic and that just means that there's going to be two antinodes, so two of those loops. So let me show you the third one. So now there are one, two, three antinodes and we still have the nodes at the ends but we now have two nodes in the middle of the string. So this is our third harmonic and you would just continue increasing the frequency to find all of the other modes of vibration. You're going to need six to eight of these in total. So the next part of the video I'll show you how you get your data. So here's an overhead view of the apparatus with some paper laid out to make it easier for you to see the nodes and antinodes. The manual tells you to turn your amplitude up to mid-range on the dial. I actually recommend you turn it to about one-third of the maximum amplitude. The on-off switch is a little hard to see. It's up here at the top, so you turn this on and it immediately sets the frequency to 100.0 Hz, which is actually way too high for our purposes. So we're going to turn this right down. There's two knobs to adjust the frequency with. There's this one, which is the coarse adjust, and this one, which is the fine adjust. So the coarse adjust changes the frequency by 1 hertz at a time, and the fine adjust changes it by 0.1 hertz at a time. So I'm going to turn this right down. 
The manual tells you to go looking for the fundamental mode of vibration first, so the first harmonic. So that's the one where there's one antinode right in the middle of the string, and the nodes are right at the end of the string. The fundamental mode of vibration is actually one of the harder ones to find, so I actually recommend that you start with the second one, maybe go up to the third and the fourth ones, and then come back to the fundamental mode of vibration, just because after you've had a little bit of experience getting these harmonics, it's easier to go back and get the first one. I will also give you a bit of a hint that for most of the apparatus that you're using in the lab, uh, the fundamental mode of vibration is going to be somewhere between about 10 and 15 hertz. That's not an exact range, but that's a good place to go looking for it. So just so that you can see some of the nodes and antinodes, I'm going to go up to one of the higher modes of vibration. I'm going to go up to the fourth one. Now just due to the frame rate on the computer, this is going to look a little wonky. Um, the way it looks when I'm staring at it is that this just looks like a very consistent blur. It doesn't look like it's flipping back and forth. I know the video makes it look like it's twitchy, but it's actually not in real life. Here you can see we've got an antinode. It's vibrating a lot. And here we've got a node, so that's where the string is still. And there's another node over here, which is a bit harder to see because the apparatus is in the way. Now when you've found a certain pattern, one of the harmonics like this, your job is to play around with it and try and get this pattern looking as big as possible. So you'd adjust your frequency to make that pattern look as big as it can. So for example, I've gone a little past the perfect frequency now, and although it's still got an antinode here and a node here, the pattern got a lot smaller. So I want to adjust this until that vibration looks as big as it possibly can. So once you've found this point where the vibration looks as big as it can look, you want to come up with an uncertainty on your frequency. So there is an instrument uncertainty for this device, this sine wave generator, but we've got a source of physical uncertainty that's way bigger than that. So we're actually going to neglect the instrument uncertainty of the device and just use our source of physical uncertainty as our total uncertainty. So what is this source of physical uncertainty? It's the fact that I can adjust the frequency a little bit and the pattern doesn't look any smaller. So I can go up and down a little bit and to my eye that looks like it's vibrating the same amount. So to find your uncertainty, what you need to do is explore the range of frequencies that give you this maximum vibration. So if I go up too far, this pattern gets noticeably smaller. So I go down to the frequency where it looks maximum again and call that my upper range on the frequency. And then I go down and keep watching to see whether the pattern looks any smaller. And when I move to a frequency where it does look smaller, and you may not be able to see this, but to my eye it just subtly got smaller here, then go up, back up one, and that's my lower limit for the frequencies that give me this maximum pattern of vibration. So I've discovered that my best value is right in the middle of that, 42.2, but I can go down or up by 0.1 hertz, and the pattern looks the same to me. So what I would record in my book would be 42.2 hertz, as my best estimate for the frequency where I get the maximum pattern, and my uncertainty would be half of the range that I explored. So I found a range of 0.2, I could go up and down by 0.1. So if the range is 0.2, use half of that as your uncertainty, plus or minus 0.1. Now every single pattern that you study could have a different physical uncertainty. So every single time you're going to have to go in and explore that range and find the range of frequencies that still give you that maximum pattern, and then you'll use half of that as your uncertainty, and you'll split the difference to find your best value for the frequency itself. So now I'm going to go up to a larger harmonic, just so you can see more than one antinode at the same time. So this was the fourth one, that means I've got four of these antinodes on the string right now. I'm going to go up to the sixth one. So now the pattern's a little more subtle, but I can still see that this is an antinode, it's vibrating a lot. This is another antinode, it's also vibrating a lot. And then I've got a node here where it's not moving much, and another node over here where it's not moving much, and again there's one at the end of string as well. So assume that I've played around and found the frequency where this pattern looks as big as possible. Again, before I write anything down, I want to explore the range of frequencies where this pattern still looks its maximum. So I can go, let's say, up, and to me that looks the same. Go up again. Again, it doesn't look much different to me. One more. You may or may not be able to see this, but to my mind it got just a little bit smaller now. So I'll go back down, and I'll call this my upper range on the frequencies that give me my maximum vibration. So now I'll go back down, 
So that's where I started. And I'll go the other way. So I go down. Do I see a difference? Not really. Go down again. Do I see a difference? A very small one. And again, maybe on the video you can't see that, but to me it got just subtly smaller. So I go back up. And I'll call this the lower edge of my range of frequencies that give me the maximum pattern of vibration. So I was able to go from 63.3 up to 63.6, .6, and the pattern looked the same to me. So for the value that I'm going to actually write down, I'm going to split the difference. It'll be 63.45, which is the exact midpoint of my range. And for my uncertainty, because I had a range of 0.3 hertz that I could adjust up and down, I'll just split that in half, so 0.15 would be my uncertainty. So my value would be 63.45 plus or minus 0.15. So that's how you get your frequency values, but there's something else you need to measure for every pattern, and that is you need to measure all of your internodal distances. So there's a node, there's a node, this is the internodal distance. Likewise, that's a node, that's a node, this is the second internodal distance. And because this is the sixth harmonic, and I have six of these antinodes, I'm going to have six internodal distances that I need to measure. So you'll have to devise a good way to measure this, because if you get too close to the string, you actually disturb it. So you'll have to be a little bit careful. So you'll move your ruler in here, and you'll get the best estimate you can for the internodal distance. And then you want to think about uncertainties again. So you'll have the regular reading uncertainty due to the ruler, but then you'll want to think about things like how wide is that node? You know, how good can I be at estimating where its exact center is? And there'll be likewise an uncertainty for this node. Also, over here on the ends, so on this end or on the pulley end, you may need to make that physical uncertainty a little bit bigger just because it's harder to figure out where the node is when there's other apparatus in the way. So when you found your pattern, you measure all of the internodal distances. So again, for the sixth harmonic, I'm going to have six internodal distances that I measure. The reason why we're measuring these is we're going to average them all together to get a more exact value for the internodal distance, and then we want to calculate what the wavelength of the wave traveling on the string is. And one wavelength is just going to be two times the internodal distance. So if you think about a sine wave, it's just going to be two of these loops. So one wavelength is twice the internodal distance, and that's why we're measuring the internodal distance. So the frequencies and the internodal distances are the things you need to measure, and you're going to be making a graph of these. So you need at least six to eight data points. That means you need to study at least six to eight of the harmonics. So go down to the fundamental one, take your measurements, go to the second harmonic, take measurements, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and ideally you go right up to the eighth. So eight is better than six, but it does get a little bit harder to find the harmonics the further up you get. So at least six, and preferably eight, harmonics in total you take measurements from. And once you've got all that data, you're ready to make your graph. Now as I said, the point of this experiment is that we want to figure out the velocity of the wave traveling on the string. So there's two equations. We first of all got our theoretical equation. So you're just going to plug numbers in here and get a theoretical value for the velocity of the wave on the string. T here is the tension in the string, so mg where m is the mass that's dangling off the end of the pulley. Mu is called linear string density. The value of this is listed in your lab manual. We get our experimental value of v by making a graph. So I want to be very clear. You don't plug numbers into this equation and calculate a number for v. You're going to plot your data on a graph, and if you do it right, v will be your slope. But you have to be a little bit careful, because you'll notice that this is not in the form that one variable is on one side of the equation, and the other variables on the other side of the equation. So in other words, it does not fit into the format of y equals mx plus b. You have to linearize this equation. That is to say, you have to rearrange this equation such that one of your variables is over on one side of the equal sign, the other variable is on the other side of the equal sign. And then, as I said, if you do this right, your slope should give you v. So you'll use your graph to get one value for the velocity of the wave on the string, and using this equation you'll calculate a theoretical value for the velocity of the wave on the string, and then you compare those two numbers to see whether they agree within the limits of uncertainty or not.